Okay, hey there. Sorry for the late start. We seem to have had a few technical difficulties, but now we are ready to go. So we're beginning to begin the Real English Party Afternoon Book Club. My apologies, I'm starting about, I would say, about five minutes late because we had some technical difficulties getting started, but now we're ready. Of uh, Let me just, I guess I'll have to log in my tablet so that you can actually see the book. But as we start, I guess we'll just start off by let you know what has happened so far. If you have not watched our previous event, then maybe you will need to know this. Uh, basically, our main character is a young man who was once, when he was a boy, his mother was killed violently by a car accident on a bridge. His father started drinking at that time and their lives were falling apart because of it. And so the boy made a prayer to God that if his father would stop drinking, that he would do anything that God asked him to do. And of course, his father did stop drinking, and so then the boy felt he owed God something. And as he did do his best, he did well in school. He volunteered to do things, and he, he did extracurricular activities. He did many things to try to make up or pay back uh, God having granted his wish. But he still didn't feel like he really paid back God. And he got the opportunity to help to, to do God's will when he was passing by a creepy old house with a creepy old man that lived there and it's in his creepy old dog. And of course the man was in distress. He had fallen off his ladder um, and his dog who was used to be very scary, but now is just creepy and old. His dog uh, was there in the house as well, but the man had to be taken to the hospital and would have to stay in the hospital for a number of days. And so the boy felt that it was his time to pay back God by offering to help this man by uh, going back to his house every day to essentially to feed the dog and to take care of this, this creepy old dog. Of uh, That's pretty much where we left off, I think. You know, what we did hear that, that uh, perhaps the, let's see, that perhaps the, uh, Yeah, I, I'm guessing that uh, that yeah, this 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 saving of the old man that this boy just happened to do on one winter day was was public publicized throughout the town. So he became well known for having saved this old man. And uh, of course, uh, we don't know exactly what happens next. But uh, my best guess is that going forward, we will discover. Uh, that he will go back to this old man's house to take care of the dog and probably make a few more discoveries having done that. And then our adventure will begin. Because remember, although this story seems very kind, quite sad and uh, very realistic so far, the, the, the title of this book is Fairy Tale. And it is a Stephen King book. So we would have to think that certainly this is a, yeah, this is a book that will have some magical, mystical elements to it and some supernatural things happening. So one would think that this that this story was going to take on a, a fantastic uh, air at some point in, 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 as we read along. So we haven't gotten there yet. So the plot hasn't really kicked in yet. We're really only up to, like, I think, the second part of the second chapter now. So there's still a lot more to read. Uh, but but uh, that's where we're starting off. What I need to do first and foremost is to log on my tablet so that you will be able to read along. And so, of course, I have an old tablet, a really old, dodgy tablet, so it will take some time for it to log on. And if, I, if things had gone better, perhaps then <laughs> everything would be logged on as it should be. As it, as it happens, I had a very late day or actually morning at the kindergarten that I work at on some mornings and I had to meet the parents. And so I really couldn't be back here as on the time that I had scheduled. Even so, uh, we are ready to go. I think my tablet is in the process of logging in. 
And so pretty soon you will be able to see another screen if it doesn't fail. And at that time, we will be ready to begin. Okay, let's see. Yeah, here we go. It's, it is logging on. Okay, so it was logging on, and then it didn't log on. Let's see. It seems to now be frozen. Ah, this is unfortunate. <laughs> so what we'll do is we're, we're going to have to, I guess, delay the reading of this. I guess this will give people some time to catch up if they need to. Uh, uh, just to, I guess, to, to tell a little bit more about what we what we're doing today, we have the afternoon book club where I'm just doing the live reading, and then after that, uh, this evening we're going to have the evening book club where I'm going to be, um, I guess, joined by uh, Yoshie and po possibly Setsu, and they that will not be a live broadcast. So if you do want to join that, you can click on the event in the website, and you can find it that way. Uh, in the meantime, we're, while we're still waiting for my tablet to power on, and it seems to have so seems to have gone bust somehow. So let's see if we can get this going. Okay, and then on Wednesday evenings, we also have another book club that you're able to join. So on Tuesday evenings, we're reading a slightly easier book for less experienced readers, I would think. And then that book is uh, The Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing by Judy Bloom. And that book, we are uh, we're pretty a good way, we're a good way through it, but actually we're at the really the part of the book. So it's a great time to, I guess, to join if you would like to join. Certainly this is the perfect time to join because we are starting a new chapter in the book and a new major part of the book. And also, the same thing is happening in our Wednesday evening book club at eight o'clock on Wednesday evenings. We're reading Dr. Doolittle, and that would be Eiko and possibly Setsu as well. And so you're welcome to join that. That also will not be live. The only reason why this is live is because there are no members. If a member had decided to join while it was live, then they would probably be able to attend for free. But really, it's more promotional. So what we would like people to do is later on, if they would like to join, we would make this private and then it would be about 1,100 yen per event. So you can join the event for 1,100 yen and you'll have a chance to read along with me and have it explained by an experienced party host and English instructor. Uh, but um, for the time being, uh, we're still waiting for my tablet to log on. It seems to have frozen and then turned off so if it if i'm not able to get it going uh, in the next few minutes or so i may have to just i guess use my smartphone which is not good because the smartphone usually excuse me, the smartphone usually has a very small screen it's very hard to read and you can't really see a full page as or a proper full page as you would using the tablet. So we're really hoping that we'll be able to use the tablet today. And it looks like, okay, so it looks like the tablet is logging in and now I just need to be able to open the book and share the screen. So please bear with me one moment as we accomplish this task. And also, if anyone has any comments, you can leave a comment on the web page that this is being live streamed from. Um, of course, to, in order to make a comment, you would need to be a member of the page, but that's free. You just have to give your, your email address and you can become a member and make any comments, ask any questions you would like to ask. Or you can make a request to join by just clicking and filling in your information and you can join future events or even this event if I can catch that information fast enough. It looks like things are going so slowly now that it may very well be that you would have time to send me a comment and I would be able to include you in these events by the time my tablet actually logs on. Looks like it's getting there, but just slowly, slowly. So sorry for the, for the delay, really.
Okay, let's see. It's not gonna oh my gosh. Okay, everything should be logged on. Yeah, so it looks like my tablet is just not doing the trick here. So I'm going to have to log it off and we will have to use my phone, unfortunately. Hmm. Oh, okay. Actually, no, it looks like we're it's going here. It's just got some problems, it's just taking some time. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my my camera and my microphone for about five minutes. If you can bear with me for five minutes while I set this up, I apologize. And we will get started promptly at 2.23, okay? So I apologize for that. I'm going to just turn off, sign off for a moment. The, the live will continue to be live and then we'll start a little bit later after I can get this tablet or some device operating properly. So we'll be right back. Stay tuned, I'll be right back.
Okay, so now we're back. It looks like we've got everything functioning. Uh, what it, it looks like my old tablet needs to be updated. It, because I only use it for this function only, and I use the other tablets and other di devices for other things, I usually I neglect it. And so I don't update the applications. And so a lot of the times, I mean, it's old enough so it doesn't function quickly, but then often the applications are crashing like you can see here, because they haven't been updated. And so I probably need to update this tablet if I want to continue to use it. I apologize for that. But it does, it is functioning serviceably now. So we will jump right into the story. Hopefully, if you're if you're just joining us, you uh you you can you know what we're doing here. We know what we, we are as a story, and we know that our main character, Charles, Charlie, I, I believe his name is, has volunteered to help an old man, Mr. Bowditch with his dog because he has injured himself and must go to the hospital. So his dog will need to be taken care of. And that's the scene we're in, okay? So here we go, to begin. The man and woman on the sidewalk were wearing jackets that said Arcadia County, Arcadia County Hospital Ambulance Service. They had a gurney with a shitload of equipment piled on it. They had moved aside by backpack and the man was trying his best to yank the bolt. He was having more luck than I did. He's around back, I said. I heard him calling for help. Great, but I can't get this thing. Take hold, kid, maybe with both of us. I took hold and we pulled. The bolt finally shot back, pinching my thumb. In the heat of the moment, I hardly noticed. But by that night, most of the nail had turned black. They went alongside the house, the gurney bumping its way through the high grass, the equipment piled on top of it, jittering and jiving. Radar came limping around the corner, growling and trying to sound fearsome. She was giving it her best shot, but after all the excitement, I could see she didn't have much left. Down, Radar, I said, and on her belly she went, looking grateful. The EMTs still gave her a wide berth. They saw Mr. Bowditch sprawled on the porch steps and got busy un unloading his gear, unloading their gear. The woman made soothing comments about him. It didn't look, at, look that bad and they, no, let me start, start that sentence again. The woman made soothing comments about how it didn't look that bad and they'd give him something to make him more comfortable. He already had something, I said, and took the Imprin bottle out of my pocket. The male EMT looked at it and said, Jesus, these are ancient. Any pop they met, they had was gone. It was long gone. C.C. Demerol. 20 should do it. Radar was back. She gave C.C. a token growl, then went to her master, whining. Bowditch stroked the top of her head with a cupped hand. And when he took it away, the dog huddled on the steps next to him. Okay, so now basically we're going through the story. The EMT has arrived. Uh, the, our hero has called the EMT, the EMT. The EMT is the ambulance workers, right? Emergency, emergency medical trend technicians. Uh, they are the, the people who come and they help in the place of a doctor when someone has a medical emergency. One of the EMT workers' names is CC. We can tell that much. They had trouble getting into the yard because the gate was kind of broken. And so our hero had to help them to open the gate and he injured his finger in doing that. And of course the dog, Radar, who was very old now and not very powerful, was still trying to protect his owner, Mr. Bowditch. Uh, and eventually though, he had to be taken away from Mr. Bowditch and that's where we continue on. So next page. That dog saved your life, sir, I said. She can't go to the hospital and she can't go hungry. I was holding the silver back door key. He looked at it while Cece gave him a shot that he didn't even seem to register. He gave another harsh sigh. All right, that, what fucking choice do I have? Her food is in a big plastic bucket in the pantry behind the door. She gets a cup at six and one at six in the morning if they keep be overnight. 
He looked at the male EMT. Will they? Don't know, sir. That's above my pay grade. He was unwrapping a blood pressure cuff. CC gave me a look that said, yeah, they'd be keeping him overnight. And that was just for starters. Cup at six tonight. Six tomorrow. Got it? I don't know how much food is left in that bucket. His eyes were starting to get glazy. If you need to buy more, go to a pet pantry. She eats origin, regional red. No meat and no snacks. A boy who knows a boy who knows who Nietzsche was can probably remember that. I'll remember. The male EMT had pumped up the blood pressure cuff, and whatever he was seeing, he didn't like it. We're going to get you to the gir on the gurney, sir. I'm Craig, and this is Cece. I'm Charlie Reed, I said. He's Mr. Bowditch. I know his first I don't know his first name. Howard, Mr. Bowditch said. They made to lift him, but he told them, wait. He held Radar by the sides of her face and looked into her, uh, her eyes. You be a good girl. I'll see you very soon. She whined and licked him. A tear ran down one of his cheeks. Maybe it was pain, but I don't think so. There's money in the flower canister in the kitchen, he said. Then his eyes cleared for a moment and his mouth tightened. Belay that. Flower canister's empty. I forgot. If you, sir, Cece said, we really need to get you into the, he glanced at her and told her to hush a minute. Then he looked at me. If you need to buy another bag of food, pay for it yourself. <laughs> I'll, pay, I'll pay you back, understand? Okay, so that's what we've got so far, right? Basically, the boy has agreed and, the, and Mr. Baldich has agreed to allow the boy, Charlie, our hero, to take care of his dog by coming to the house and feeding the dog. He seems to have told the dog, told the boy that he had money in a canister if he needed to buy more dog food, but then it seems like he had a second thought. He said, belay that. And belay is not a word we often hear, right? I very rarely hear that, but we can guess what that means, right? He says, belay that, flower canister's empty. So once he says that, that, that there's money in the canister, but then he says belay that, the flower canister's empty, we can guess that belay must mean something like of never mind, or that's not true, or mm, uh, maybe something like negate that, you know? Basically what belay would have to say maybe to strike something out, but maybe the last thing that you said is not true, we might say belay that or forget that. Right? So we can guess what that word means. And of course, Google could give us the definition, but let's live with guessing the, the vocabulary for today. There was another phrase here that I thought would be useful to know, but just to make sure that you understand it. Of maybe, okay. That's the phrase. So, so Mr. Baldich asked the EMT worker if he would have to stay overnight. And the EMT worker responds, don't know, sir, or meaning I don't know. That's above my pay grade. Okay, so now that's a native idiom that we often use when someone's asking a question that we are not qualified to answer. Or basically we're saying that we're not qualified to answer. Obviously, someone who gets paid more money who would, would be qualified to answer that question. So we would say that's a person in a higher pay grade. So basically that, which is the question, is a question that's above my pay grade, means that I don't get paid enough money to answer those kinds of questions. And whenever someone asks you a question that you don't know the answer to because you're not qualified to answer, it would be normal for you to say that's above my pay grade. It basically means it would it, that requires a professional to answer, and I'm not a professional in that subject, so I can't answer. That's a useful phrase, a useful idiom that we often use. Okay, but we got a late start, so let's move on as best we can. Go into the next page. Yes, I I understood something else. 
Even with some prime dope doing a number on him, Mr. Baldich knew he wouldn't be back tonight or tomorrow night. All right, then. Take care of her. She's all I've got. I gave Radar, he gave Radar a final stroke, ruffling her ears, then nodded to the EMTs. He gave a cry through his clamped teeth when they lifted him, and Radar barked. Boy, yes, don't snoop. I didn't dignify that with an answer. Craig and Cece more or less lifted the gurney around the side of the house so as not to joggle him too much. I went over and looked at the extension ladder in the grass then up at the roof. I guessed he'd been cleaning out the gutters or trying to. I went back to the steps and sat down. Out front, the siren started up again, loud at first and then diminishing as it headed down the hill to the goddamn bridge. Radar looked toward the, toward the sound, her ears pricking up. I tried stroking her. When she didn't bite or even growl, I did it again. Looks like it's just you and me, girl, I said. Radar put her muzzle on my shoe. He didn't even say thank you, I told her. What a snot. But I wasn't really mad because it didn't matter. I didn't need to be thanked. This was payback. Okay, so now Mr. Bowditch has left in the ambulance. He's left with the dog. Charlie is left with the dog, and it looks like that he is starting to get along with the dog because the dog is lonely. And he's complaining because Mr. Bowditch didn't seem to have much gratitude for what he was doing, but he decides that that's not important. It didn't matter because this is about between him and God. This is payback. So when he says payback, what he's saying is sometimes we use the word payback to mean revenge. But in this case, it's positive. Payback means to pay back a favor or to return a favor or a kindness. So he's going to pay back God by helping Mr. Bowditch. So he doesn't need Bowditch to say thank you. This is his what he owes to God, right? So that's a useful phrase there, payback, right? I don't know if there's too much else there, but uh, if you have any questions, you can leave a comment, right? And, or you can join next time, right? Moving on to section three, and I think we'll finish after section three, assuming that it's the same length. So, I called dad and filled him in as I walked around the house, hoping no one had stolen my backpack. Not only was it still there, one of the EMTs had taken a moment to drop it over the gate. Dad asked me if there, were, if there was anything he could do. I told him no, I'd stay where I was, and do some, things, do some studying until it was time to feed Radar at six, then come home. He said he'd pick up some Chinese and see me when I got there. I told him I loved him, and he said right back at you. I fished the bike lock out of, my, out of my backpack, thought about lifting the Schwinn over the house side, then said, screw it, and I just locked it to the gate. I took a step back and almost tripped over Radar. She yelped and scrambled away. Sorry, girl, sorry. I knelt and held up my hand. After a moment or two, she came to it, sniffed, and gave it a little lick. So much for Cujo the Terrible. I went around back with her right behind me, and that's when I noticed the outbuilding. I figured it for a tool shed. No way was it big enough for a car. I thought about putting the downed ladder inside and decided not to bother, since it didn't look like rain. As I discovered later, I would have toted it the 40 yards or so to not avail, to no avail, because there was a huge padlock on the door, and Mr. Bowditch had taken the rest of his keys. I let us in, found an old-fashioned light switch, the kind that turns and walked down the hall with the old reading matter of the kitchen, to the kitchen. The light there was provided by an overhead frosted glass fixture that looked like part of the set dressing in one of those old TCM movies Dad liked. The kitchen table was covered with checked oil cloth, faded but clean. I decided everything in the kitchen looked like set dressing from an old movie. I could almost imagine Mr. Chips strolling in, wearing his, his gown and mortarboard, or maybe Barbara Stanwyck, 
telling Dick Powell he was just in time for a drink. I sat down at the table. Radar went under it and settled with a small ladylike grunt. I told her she was a good girl and she thumped her tail. Don't worry, he'll be back soon. Maybe, I thought. I spread out my books, did some math problems, then put in my ear pods and played the next day's French assignment, a pop song called Rien Queen Oui, which means something like just once. Not exactly my cup of tea. I'm more of a classic rock guy, but it was one of those songs you like more every time you hear it, until it turns into an earworm, that is, and then you hate it. I played it through three times, then sang along, as we'd be required to do in class. Okay, so we're gonna go into what the song was, or what the song is in the next page. But first, let's stop and look at some of the things on the page. Okay, so now I don't know if we pointed this out earlier, but you know, Charlie's friend, uh, who had encountered uh, the dog, Radar, called the dog Cujo. That's kind of a joke because Cujo is a a, a a dog, a big scary dog. That that was that was the sort of the bad guy, the monster in another one of Stephen King's books, which also became a movie. So Cujo was a famous book, and it was the name of this big scary dog who got rabies, uh, basically became sick and crazy, and as big as it was, it basically started killing everyone in the neighborhood uh, until eventually, obviously, something was done. But it was a pretty scary movie when I when I watched it. I don't think I've read the book, but I think I did see the movie. Pretty scary movie. But the, the, you know that's not really vocabulary, right? The only new vocabulary I see here is maybe some things that I probably wouldn't even know. Uh, so I would I, I want to point them out because I don't know them, and I want you to know that I'm going to just have to guess what it means, right? For example, of oil cloth, right? It says the, ki the, ki the kitchen table was covered with checked oil cloth. I don't know what oil cloth is, right? I have no idea. It says faded but clean. So it doesn't, so it definitely isn't cloth that's oily because that would be dirty, right? So I'm guessing that the oil cloth is either cloth that is somehow coated with some kind of oil so that it resists staining, or perhaps it's a cloth that's meant to protect the table from oil or, or, protect, or put, to be put on the table after the table has been oiled. We don't know. We have to guess what that is, but it's some kind of tablecloth, right? We don't need to check the dictionary for that word. We can understand. But then he also said, I could almost imagine Mr. Chips strolling in wearing his gown and mortarboard. Okay, so let's not look up the word mortarboard. Just notice that we have no idea what mortarboard is. I don't know what a mortarboard is. Probably you don't know what a mortarboard is. We could look it up. This is something it's worth looking up in the dictionary. But if we don't, that's okay, right? We don't need to know exactly what this mortarboard is. We don't even know who Mr. Chips is. I'm guessing that since he was talking about TCM movies, I guess this is a character from a movie. All right, so Mr. Chips is a character from a movie who wears a gown and has a mortar board. Yeah, a mortar board, some kind of table or handheld table or something. I'm not sure. I don't need to know, right? All right, so just to point out that there are some words that we hear that we don't know and we don't need to know, okay? And of course, he's going to now, I think, tell us the lyrics to the song that he's reading, Rien Qu'une Fois, which is French, I imagine, for just once. So let's move on to the next page and see if we can make it to the end of this section. Je suis ce créature et c'est le cœur, j'ai toujours attendu. One verse. One verse in, I happened to look under the table and saw Radar looking at me with her ears laid back and in a, an expression that looked suspiciously like pity. It made me laugh. Better not quit my day job, right? Okay, so just to 
jumped in. He is singing the song, right? So Radar is obviously is noticing he's not a good singer. So let's go, let's go on. You better not quit my day job, right? A thump of the tail. Don't blame me. It's an assignment. Want to hear it one more time? No? Me either. I, sport, I spied four matching canisters set up in a line on the counter of the, to the left of the, of the stove, marked sugar, flour, coffee, and cookies. I was pretty damn hungry. At home, I would have checked the fridge and gobbled half the contents, but of course I wasn't at home and wouldn't be for, I checked my watch, another hour. I decided to investigate the cookie jar, which surely wouldn't count as Snoopy. It was filled with, to the top with a mixture of pecan sandies and those chocolate-covered marshmallow jobbies. I decided that since I was dog-sitting, Mr. Baldrige wouldn't miss one or two or even four. I made myself stop there, but it was hard. Those sandies were certainly delicious. I looked at the flower canister and thought of Mr. Bowditch saying there was money in there. Then his eyes had changed, sharpened. Belay that. Flower canister's empty. I forgot. I almost peeked, and there was a time not so long ago when I would have. But those days were gone. I sat back down and opened my world history book. I plowed through some heavy stuff about the Treaty of Versailles and German reparations, and when I looked at the watch, my watch again, there was a clock over the sink, but it was stopped. I saw it was a quarter to six. I decided that was close enough for government work and decided to feed radar. I figured the door next to the fridge had to be the pantry, and I figured right. It had that good pantry smell. I pulled down the dangling cord to turn on the light and for a moment forgot all about feeding radar. The little room was... The, the little room was canned goods and dry goods from top to bottom and side to side. There was spam and baked beans and sardines and saltines and Campbell's soup, pasta and pasta sauce, bottles of grape and cranberry juice, jars of jelly and jam, cans of veggies by the dozens and maybe hundreds. Mr. Bowditch was all set for the apocalypse. Radar gave up, don't forget the dog wine. I looked behind the door and there was her plastic food canister. It had to hold 10 or 12 gallons full, but the bottom was barely covered. If Baldich was in the hospital for a few days or even a week, I would have to buy more. The cup measure was in the canister. I filled it and poured the kibble into the dish and with her name on it. Radar went at it with will. Tail, wit waggly, tail wagging slowly from side to side. She was old, but still happy to eat. I guess that was good. You take it easy now, I said, pulling on my jacket. Be a good girl, and I'll see you in the morning. Only, it wasn't that long. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, let's go through what, what we've read here. Okay, so now there are some words here I didn't recognize. For example, he said in the jar, there were, there were a mixture of pecan sandies. I don't know what sandies are, but I don't need to know because we can tell he's eating cookies, so we don't have to look it up in the dictionary. We can tell it's some kind of cookie, right? Maybe even short for a sandwich cookies. I know often cream-filled sandwich cookies we used to have. Maybe they call them sandies in this area where this where Charlie lives. But some kind of cookie or or, or cracker, right? We can guess, right? Uh, let's see. Were there any other words here? Basically, he helps himself to some cookies in the cookie jar. He decides not to check the flour jar that Mr. Bowditch said there would be some money inside of, and that's. That's him being honest and being a, an honorable person. He's not snooping as Mr. Baldich was afraid he might. Uh, so yeah, so he studies, uh, studies some world history. And yeah, not too many words here that are unfamiliar actually, now I think about it. You see that he uses this word again, belay that. He re repeats what Mr. Baldich said, really firming up in my mind that belay that again says, you know, strike that or forget that, right? 
we don't have to look it up. It's being re reaffirmed and confirmed and, and reinforced in our minds what this word must mean every time we see it. And that's how we gain language. Okay, then he said, I plowed through some heavy stuff about the Treaty of Versailles and German reparations. You may not know what reparations is. It's not important to the story. So again, you wouldn't have to look this up. But what are reparations? Well, essentially reparations are something you give to repair something you have broken, right? You can see kind of in there the word repair. And a reparation is something that you give, usually money, to repair something that you have broken or to fix something that you've done wrong. Normally, this is something that is paid by a whole government that has done something wrong to another country or people. So you can imagine after World War II, Germany had to pay reparations to other parts of Europe as a part of the Treaty of Versailles, which is the treaty they signed after World War II uh, when they had lost the war. Mm -hmm. So there's one word you might be able to use. Oh, that word often comes up in American politics uh, as they talk about how African-Americans or Black people in Amer America should be paid money as reparations for slavery that happened hundreds of years ago. Uh, never been much for that argument, but you know that that often comes up. Reparations comes up in that context a lot in English conversation. And then we moved on to the next page. I think basically that's just talking about how much food is in this pantry. He says that Mr. Bowditch was all set for the apocalypse. Apocalypse. Apocalypse is basically the end of the world as described in the Bible, or as described in texts surrounding the Bible's text. So yeah, you know, it's, it is foretold in many religious traditions that the world will end and will end tragically and maybe through a great war or mass destruction and that is known as the apocalypse, right? So you can imagine that if the apocalypse, if the apocalypse should happen and you have to try to survive it somehow, you would need lots of emergency supplies. So Mr. Bowditch having all of these canned goods and, pro and products means that he is prepared for the apocalypse for some major disaster that he would have to survive on his own, all right? And then at the end, he says, uh, he feeds the dog and then he says goodbye to the dog and says, I'll see you in the morning. And it says, only it wasn't that long. So now it looks like something more is happening here. All right, I guess that night something more would happen. I'm, my, my curiosity is piqued, so I will not stop there. We're going to read section four, all right? And then we'll see if we can see what happens next and then we'll finish there. So, dad and I pigged on Chinese food and I gave him the expanded version of my afternoon adventure, starting with Bowditch on the steps, progressing to the hall of old reading matter, and finishing with the doomsday pantry. Hoarder, Dad said, seen my share of it, usually after the hoarder in question died, but the place is clean, you say. I nodded, the kitchen at least, a place for everything and everything in its place. There was some dust on the old medicine bottles in the little bathroom, but I didn't see any, didn't see any anywhere, anywhere else. No car, nope, and not room for one in his in his tool shed. He must have his groceries delivered, and of course, there's always Amazon, which is by 2040, which by 2040 will be the world government the right wingers are so afraid of. I wonder where the, his money comes from and how much is left. I'd wondered that too. I think that kind of curiosity is pretty normal in people who've come within a whisker of going broke. Dad got up. I bought and carried. Now I need to clear some paperwork. You clean up. I cleaned up. Then practice some blues tunes on my guitar. I could play almost anything, just as long as it was in the key of E. Usually I could get into the music until my fingers hurt, but not that night. I put my Yamaha back in the corner and told dad I was going up to Mr. Bowditch's house to check on radar. I kept thinking of her being there all by herself. Maybe dogs didn't care about such things, but maybe they did. 
fine. As long as you don't decide to bring it back. Her. Okay. But not interested in listening to a lonely dog howl at three in the morning, no matter what sex it happens to be. I won't bring her back. He didn't need to know that. The, he didn't need to know that the idea that the idea had at least crossed my mind. And don't let Norman Bates get you. I looked at him surprised. What? You think I didn't know? He was grinning. People were calling it the psycho house long before you, your kids, and were born in, in, in people call people, well, let's go back. What, you think I didn't know? He was grinning. People were calling it the psycho house long before you and your friends were born, little hero. Okay, all right, so now, so, okay, looks like Charlie, for some reason, feels like he needs to go back and check on the dog. He feels sorry for the dog being lonely. Uh, and that's basically all that's going on so far. So that seems to be the reason why he's going, he, it w wouldn't be that long, because actually, Charlie himself just decides to go back to check on the dog. Mm -hmm. So there's some interesting phrases here that we could talk about if you were here. Uh, but since you're not, and I am still a little bit curious of what's going to happen. We haven't reached three o'clock yet, and we had a late start. So let's move on to se section five, and then we'll finish there. That made me smile. But it was harder to see the humor when I got to the corner of Pine and Sycamore. The house seemed to hulk on its hill, blotting out the stars. I remembered Norman Bates saying, Mother, so much blood. And I wished I'd never seen the damn movie. The gate bolt was easier to pull, at least. I used my phone's flashlight to walk around the house. I ran my flash over the side of it once and wished I hadn't. The windows were dusty, all the shades pulled. Those windows looked like blind eyes that were somehow still seeing me and not liking my in intrusion. I rounded the corner, and as I started toward the back porch, there was a thump. It startled me, and I dropped my phone. As it fell, I saw a moving shadow. I didn't cry out, but I felt my balls curl up and pull up tight against my scrot. I froze and that shadow rippled toward me. And then before I could turn and run, Radar was whining and nosing at the leg of my pants and trying to jump up on me. Because of her bad back and hips, all she could do was make a series of aborted lunge, abortive lunges. The thump must have been the dog the dog door swinging shut. I dropped to my knees and grabbed her, one hand stroking her head while the other scratched her rough under the collar. She licked my face and crammed against me so tight that she almost tipped me over. It's okay, I said. Were you, were you scared to be alone? I bet you were. And when was the last time she had been alone? If Mr. Baldich didn't have a car, and all his groceries were delivered, maybe not for a long time. That's okay, all good, come on. I picked up my phone, gave my balls a second to settle back into their proper place, then went to the back door with her walking so close beside me that her head kept bumping my knee. At once upon a time, Andy Chin had encountered a monster dog in, front, in the front yard of this place, or so he said, but that was years ago. This was just a scared old lady who'd heard me coming and bolted out through her dog door to meet me. We went up to the back porch steps. I unlocked the door and used the turn switch to light the hall of the old reading matter. I checked the dog, I checked the dog door and saw there were three small bolts, one, each, one on each side and, on, and another on top. I reminded myself to run them before I, I left so radar couldn't go wandering. The backyard was probably fenced like the front one, but I didn't know that for sure. And for the time being, she was my responsibility. In the kitchen, I knelt in front of Radar and stroked the sides of her face. She looked at me attentively, ears pricked. I can't stay, but I'm gonna leave, leave a light on and I'll come back tomorrow morning and feed you, okay? All right, so that will stop there for a moment. So he was walking up to the, the, the Bowditch house. The Bowditch house is scary, of course. It reminds him of the, the Psycho house from the movie Psycho that we talked about last time. 
when Norman Bates had killed people dressed up as his mother? No, I don't think there are too many advanced words here. This was a little difficult to read because of the way things were described, but hopefully you can understand most of what happened here. He just basically went back to the house, was surprised that the dog had run outside the house from the, by the doggy door and that he came to meet him because he was so lonely. Brought the dog back in the house, pet him a little bit, and now he's saying goodbye again. All right. She whined, licked my hand, and then went to her dish. It was empty, but she gave it a few licks and then looked at me. The message was pretty clear. No more until morning, I said. She laid down and put her muzzle on her paw, never taking her eyes off me. Well, I went to the canister marked cookies. Mr. Bowditch had said no meat, no snacks. And I decided he could have no he could he could have meant no meat snacks. Semantics are wonderful, aren't they? I vaguely remembered hearing a reading somewhere that dogs are allergic to chocolate. So I took one of the pecan sandies and broke off a piece. I offered it. She sniffed, then took it delicately from my fingers. I sat down at the table where I'd done my studying, thinking I should just go. She was a dog, for Christ's sake, not a child. She might not like being alone, but it wasn't like she was going to get into the cabinet under the sink and drink bleach. My phone buzzed. It was dad. Everything okay there? Fine. But it's good I came. I left the dog door open. She came out when she heard me. No need to tell him that when I, when I saw that moving shadow, I had a, wait, one, more, one more time. No need to tell him that when I saw that moving shadow, I had a single flash of Janet Lee in the shower screaming and trying to avoid the night. Not your fault. You can't think of everything. Coming back? Pretty soon, I looked at Radar, look, Radar looking at me. Dad, maybe I should. Bad idea, Charlie. You've got school tomorrow. She's a grown up dog. She'll be fine overnight. Sure, I know. Radar got up a process that was little painful to watch. When she got to her head hindquarters under her, she walked off into the dark of what was probably the living room. I'll just stay a few minutes. She's a nice dog. Okay. All right. So, he's still there. Can't seem to say goodbye to this dog. Dog wants to eat, so he decides to give the dog, a piece of a cookie, a piece of a pecan cookie. No, not, not much here to re in the way of new vocabulary, I think, except that once again, we see a phrase here that you might know this one, right? For Christ's sake, right? Here he says, hmm, she was a dog for Christ's sake, not a child. Here's that word, that phrase, for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. For Christ's sake is almost like a swear word. It basically is, again, giving, giving more emphasis to our expression. So what we're saying, we want to give more emphasis and even exasperation to what we're saying by saying for Christ's sake. I think we, we, we encountered a phrase that was similar to that in our last reading. I think it was, can you remember what that was? I think it was... Uh, uh, for crying out loud, right? I was just trying to help for crying out loud. This is a similar expression, for Christ's sake, actually. It means actually it has the same function. We've used this just to emphasize at the argument that we're making. Mm -hmm. But let's see if we can get to the end of section three. I ended the call and heard a low speaking sound a low squeaking sound. Radar came back with a toy in her mouth. I thought maybe it was a monkey, but it was so chewed it was hard to tell. I still had my phone in my hand, so I took a picture. She brought the toy and dropped it in my, by my chair. Her eyes told me that I was what I was supposed to do. I gave it a soft, a soft lob across the room. Radar limped after it, picked it up, 
made it squeak a few times to show it what who it, show it who was boss and brought it back. She plunked it down beside my chair. I could imagine her, her as a young dog, heavier and much more agile, going after that poor old monkey or its predecessor at a full tilt run. The way Andy said she'd run at him that day. Now her running days were over, but she was giving it her best shot. I could imagine her thinking, see how good I am at this? Stick around. I can do it all night. Only she couldn't, and I couldn't stay. Dad wanted me home, and I doubted it if, I, if I'd sleep much anyway if I stayed here. Too many mysterious creaks and groans, too many rooms where anything might be lurking and creeping toward me once the lights were out. Radar brought the squeaky monkey back. No more, I said. Rest up, girl. I started up, I started for the back hall, then had an idea. I went to the darkened room where Radar had, Radar had found her toy and groped around for a switch, hoping nothing, Norman Bates, wrinkled mummy of a mother, or not, for instance, would grab my hand. The switch made a clacking sound when I found it and flipped it. Like the kitchen, Mr. Baldich, Mr. Baldich's living room was old, tiny, but neat. There was a couch un, un, upholstered. No. There was a couch upholstered in, the, in dark brown fabric. It looked to me as if it hadn't had much use. Most of the sitting appeared to have been done in an easy chair plank, plonked down on the middle of an old-fashioned rag, rag rug. I could see that devote. I could, see the divot, I could see the divot made by Mr. Baldich's skinny shanks. A blue chambray shirt was tossed over the, black, the back. The chair faced a TV that looked prehistoric. There was an antenna thing on top of it. It took a picture of it. I took a picture of it with my phone. I didn't know if a TV had, that ancient could possibly work, but judging by the books stacked on either side of it, many marked with post-it notes, it probably did, didn't get much use even if it did work. In the far corner of the room was a wicker basket piled high with dog toys. And that said all anyone would need to know about how, Mr. how much Mr. Baldich loved his dog. Radar padded across the room and grabbed a stuffed rabbit. She brought it to me, looking hopeful. Can't, I said, but you can have this. It probably smells like your guy. I grabbed the shirt off the back of the chair and spread it on the kitchen floor beside her dish. She smelled it, then lay down on it. Atta girl, I said, see you in the morning. I started for the back door, thought again, and brought her the stuffed monkey. She gave it a chew or two, maybe just to please me. I backed off a few steps and took another picture with my phone. Then I left, not forgetting to bolt the dog door. If she messed inside, I would just have to clean it up. As I walked back home, I thought about gutters, no doubt plugged with leaves, the unmoved, the, unmoved, the unmowed lawn. The place badly needed a paint job, and that was beyond me. But I could do something about those dirty windows, not to mention the sagging picket fence. If I had time, that was, if I had time, that was, and given the upcoming ball, baseball season, I didn't. Plus, there was radar. That was love at first sight, for her as well as for me, maybe. If the idea strikes you as weird or corny or both, all I can say is deal with it. As I said to my father, she was a nice dog. When I went to bed that night, I set my alarm for 5 a.m. Then I texted Mr. Neville, my English teacher, and told him I wouldn't be there period one and to tell Mrs. Fried Miss, Miss Friedlander that I might miss period two as well. I said I had to visit a guy in a hospital. Okay. Okay, so now if you were here, you could ask some questions about what we have read just to, just to discuss basically what's happened now is we're starting to realize that, that Charlie is really falling in love with this dog. And he's learning a little bit more about Mr. Baldich and how much Mr. Baldich loves the dog as well. He's ventured into the uh, Mr. Baldich's living room and, and further confirms that Mr. Baldich, one, loves his dog, and two, is a very clean and organized person, even though everything is very old. Uh, no big surprises here, but it looks like 
what's happening here is that uh, maybe our hero is going to want to help to fix up Mr. Bowditch's house, or at least clean up Mr. Bowditch's house. So I know the dog needs to be fed at six in the morning. So maybe he wants to get up at five in the morning so that he can do maybe some cleaning, maybe clean the windows or do something like that. And that's why he's telling his teachers that he will, he will miss the first period or perhaps the first two periods of school because he wants to spend that time cleaning up the house and fixing it up. So this kid is a really nice kid. I really like this character. I, I, like, the, I like the language of his narrative. It's very Stephen King, but uh, he, he also captures his youth and his budding maturity. So yeah, it's a pretty good story so far. Uh, pretty much the plot has not kicked in yet. So it, it's still a good time to join. We have now gotten to chapter three, a hospital visit, quitters never win, and the shed. Okay, so now I'm guessing something with the shed is where the plot kicks in. Okay, so something's going to happen in the shed in the back of Mr. Bowditch's house, and that's where the plot will kick in. So this would be a great time to join the uh, book club. If you are watching this, the recording, or watching it live, then by all means, consider putting your information on the bottom of the page and, and, and uh, joining the book club. I will be able to go through this with you much more slowly, uh, sentence by sentence if necessary, to explain the English and the vocabulary. And we can then discuss the story using your new vocabulary so that it becomes your vocabulary and not just Stephen King's. But for now, it looks like we're past the hour, uh, which is okay because we got a late start. But we will finish there. And so I do wish you all a great day. It's very hot out there. So be please be careful if you're going outside. You know, definitely dress appropriately. You want to protect yourself from the sun, but you also want to stay cool. You know, use the air conditioner if you have it. it definitely you will need it, I think, today. And hopefully I will see you again at the Real English Party Online Afternoon Book Club next week, or maybe even tonight. All right. Hopefully, we'll see you soon. In the meantime, please enjoy the real English party of life. See you next time.